In this episode, I wanted to share some of my recent experiences. You know, that's really what the Iron Size podcast was about when I got started, which was as I'm on my journey and I get to share time with um, some amazing instructors, amazing business people, people in the field that are out doing other amazing things, was to come back and be able to talk to people about that and hopefully share that message, spread that message, the best of of all that stuff. And so today, that's what I wanted to talk about because in this last year, I I just did some math. We're coming in on the closeout of November. It's nearly Thanksgiving here in 2022. And I I did the math. Um, First off, I've done probably six classes. I know I did. I did six classes in the month of November alone, and we're only sitting on the 23rd of the month right now. I was very busy. There were a couple of weekend events that I went to, so I got to double down. But in the course of this year of 2022, I've done over 20 classes um, and multiple open range sessions. So I've been out on the range doing different stuff, but also doing some non-range related stuff. I learned a lot of things. Uh, and I had an opportunity when I was down in my in South Florida with the Condition One group to kind of really reflect on the good things that I took away and some of the bad things I took away, but more specifically, what were the things that were most impactful and what could I share with people with regard to those experiences. So all the classes that I've done and all the stuff that I've done, here's what I learned and I continue to reflect on as I go down my journey. First, while the content was important to me, and I certainly signed up for certain courses specific to the content that was going to be taught, the, the content wasn't as important to me as how the instructors delivered the content. Each instructor has a unique way of delivering, creating the material that they're going to give you. And then also are obviously delivering that material to you. Again, in all the classes that I've taken, I've seen a ton of stuff. I've even seen some repeat things from, from instructors. And I actually get to see how some of it overlaps. Like some instructors have grown up under the wings or around some of the other instructors I've instructors I've taken. You start to hear kind of very similar things. Some of it ultimately starts to sound like it's being regurgitated a little bit. And that's okay. It's not that it's bad information. It's just being said almost in the exact or precise way the other guy might be saying it. Again, why reinvent the wheel or why, why change things if you don't need to change it? You don't. What I'm saying is it's interesting to see how the, in, the people within the industry influence other people in the industry and how that carries down the line. Here's another thing I learned. The degree of relevance of material was directly proportional to the instructor's level of current training and knowledge uh, of the people that were in front of them. Let me let me be specific. Basically, what I'm saying is they're making sure as an instructor that they're staying relevant somehow. I don't take classes from instructors because they look cool or because they've been known in the industry for 15 years or because they have a specific uh, resume. I go based on recommendation, based on the value that they've provided for whoever the person that gave me the recommendation was. And I have a lot of questions before I ultimately um, invest my time, money, and energy into these specific instructors. So when I say staying relevant, all of them that I got that I extracted the most from are people that are continually putting in a tremendous amount of effort to stay relevant as a professional. And I guess what I'm specifically like, if they're in law enforcement, um, they're not just teaching the same stuff they learned 10 years in the academy that was taught to them by the guy that was, you know, 25 years, you know, on as an officer. Or if I'm learning from military, it's not the guy that was in the war on terror 15 years ago and trying to teach me the stuff that he learned then. Or if it's the person that's out on the the current instructor who's only been into it for a couple of years is continually teaching the same things over and over. This person is these, these types of instructors are out there constantly learning from other instructors, which might go back to why I'm starting to hear what I think is sort of the same stuff because they're going to the good ones. The point of the relevance piece is, is that they're constantly trying to evolve, which is what I'm trying to do. So the evolution process stops for me when it stops for the instructor, as far as I'm concerned. So again, I'm going to choose instructors that I see are constantly trying to push the envelope for themselves and constantly challenging themselves with new things and going to other people. And I always ask them, you know, hey, if you're going to recommend somebody that I go see next or to go, you know, learn this specific thing or skill, who might I go see? There'll be more on that later. Every good instructor I've ever gone to 
the, the good ones can confidently demonstrate a palpable level of coaching competency beyond how to simply shoot a gun. Uh, there's a couple of things that go into this. First off, uh, I've never met a good instructor that wasn't good at managing themselves first. And what I mean by that is, is you can see it on them. You can smell it on them when they walk onto the range or into the classroom, onto the mat, whatever it happens to be. They are put together. They have a clear plan of action. They're moving with a the purpose. They're organized in their approach. And they get everybody on the same page as quickly as they can. And they are in control. I, they, they immediately command the respect of the people out there. As opposed to showing up to the range, you still got a, you got a guy out there who's all by himself, right, as an instructor for the day. He's still, I don't know, stapling stuff up on, on tar, stapling targets, targets up unloading things out of his truck at the time the class is supposed to start. Um, seems to always kind of be behind or second guessing what he's going to do next or always making an adjustment. The great coaches that I've been around, they have a clear plan and they're executing that plan right from the get go. There are no hiccups in the day. Now they make adjustments as needed for the class that they're in front of or specific to the people, the skill sets and the levels. Um, that means maybe progressing or regressing the, the class uh, specifically, but they're they're ready to go when you get there, and they stay ready the entire time. There's an even flow. There's there's almost always like a pre communication that's happening uh, between the instructor and, and the students. Whether that's just a check an email, uh, maybe it's even an automated email, but there's something coming through before. It's not just hey, see you on this day and time and show up. There's there's some pre work that gets done, or at least a pre prep, like an outline for what the class is. Here's how to be prepared. Again, for any coaches and or potential participants that are, that are listening out there, I think it's a good practice to follow because it shows a level of professionalism and it also again shows your level of competency. There's other levels of other competencies in there that I think are really important. Being a, an effective communicator, extraordinarily important. Seems obvious, but I've been on the range with some pretty poor communicators. Um, also, uh, being able to question skillfully and listen carefully to find out about who they're with or who their participants are or who their, their student is for the day uh, and be able to work through some common goals uh, and maybe set the expectations in a way that make the most sense for everybody. I think those are good. And then obviously their knowledge of material uh, that needs to be at a high level. And then the way they deliver that material, going back to my first statement, which was it wasn't so much about the content, it was how they delivered it. Because it could be the same content or very similar, sorry, maybe not the same, but similar content to what I may have gotten in another class, but the delivery and how they explained it or how they're articulating it could make all the difference in the world for me in terms of what little bits I pick up in order to refine my own skills, my own fundamentals, and so forth. The one thing I kind of want to maybe point out here is I think there's a, there's a big difference between being a coach and an instructor. And I personally like working with coaches. Now, there's nothing wrong with being an instructor, I, but from the, I come from the world of coaching, and I, I can really kind of uh, wrap my head around what it is that they're doing. And I think so I, 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 I can get like maybe a little stronger connection to them as a coach and trying to get what they're, get, they're trying to give. And here's what I mean. An instructor is going to give you the information. They're going to walk you through the process. They're going to do all the basics. They're going to keep you safe. They're going to encourage you. They're going to make sure everybody is doing and getting the information that they need to get. The coach is able to do that, but also understand who he or she is in front of and be able to provide very, very specific things for the individuals within the group or, you know, whatever format it happens to be so that they're able to take that information in a way and then, I guess, di uh, digest that information in a way that makes the most sense for them. There's an assessment process that's going on. There's a constant, um, I guess, feedback mechanism that's going on. And they're able to read that as a coach versus an instructor who kind of shows up like, here's what we're doing. And, you know, get up on the line. Okay, we're doing this. Next, we're going to do this. Next, we're going to do that. A good coach will be able to do that while also providing some very specific feedback and valuable information for the individuals within the class and keep it relatable. Next thing that struck me in this last year, and I think I already kind of knew this, but I think it's worth saying that most instructors should not be coaching tactics. And by the way, to call some of the stuff that they're teaching or coaching tactics is misleading. 
I'll just say say this, and other people have said this on the show, that just because you operate in a space that requires sort of tactical application, your military, your LEO, some government organization or whatever, doesn't necessarily mean you should be coaching those things either. Just because you can do it doesn't mean you should be coaching it. So that goes back to being the instructor versus the coach. Um, particularly if you're if you're outside of one of those institutions, because I think there's frameworks, there's policies, there's protocol. That might be a little bit more instruction than coaching. I think the finer points, the nuance is what gets coached. But when you're in like a civilian situation, I think, again, coaches are going to thrive better or, or students are going to thrive better when you have a coach that can, can read these things that isn't so, um, I guess, uh, in, in a silo or in, in the lanes, these lines that they have to, they have to stay within. So again, going back to like the tactics, uh, and people not teaching those just because you're, you're in those things doesn't necessarily mean you should be teaching them or bottom line, it doesn't mean you can teach them. So I think that's important to note for students out there, participants out there that are looking for something just because somebody has something on their resume or they're actively involved in a certain, you know, group unit, whatever it happens to be, uh, doesn't necessarily mean they need to be, they should be out there instructing. Now, if maybe that instructor is new to this and they're being supervised and or mentored by another great coach or instructor, I think that's a different situation. I think that's a great situation for everybody to be in, as long as it's established up front that this is what's happening um, and that that person is allowed to grow along with the students and that the, the mentor or the lead instructor is making sure they take charge and fill in where they need to. That's a big job by that lead instructor, that mentor, to be able to manage what's going on with the instructor and manage what's going on with the participants and make sure everybody's getting what they need out of that. So that makes that job even that much harder. And I think it's okay as long as you've got the talent or the skill to do that. But to, uh, to, to say that you, you, should be, you can be teaching tactics just because you do them, uh, I think that's a recipe for, for disaster. I think it takes a lot more time to develop those things. And so buyer beware and, and be cautious if you're jumping into a, a session like that or a, a class like that. To take that one step further, to me, tactics requires or tactics training requires way more coaching of fundamentals or fundamental skills and again, this goes into like the nuance and the detail. There's, I think, there's a much higher demand for the proficiency in the in in teaching the fundamentals than the tactics themselves. So, going back to those coaching proficiencies, you have to be a very very effective communicator in order to be successful at that level. In terms of that a more effective level of communication, I want to go back to that that manager of themselves before they're managing a group as a great coach. You know, I mentioned this sort of this, you know, people reaching out or making sure they're, they're setting you up for success ahead of time before you even show up. I think great coaches are going to have a much deeper understanding of who they're coaching. And this takes time. And this can be a little bit problematic if you're having groups come in on a regular basis, because now you have a bunch of people, you've got to try to understand who you're who your, your clients or your participants are for the day, you know, what their needs are, what their goals are, what their deficiencies are, those kinds of things. Uh, again, those effective communicators are, are doing that um, ahead of time and they're doing it in an effective way. Going back to the managing and showing up, the best coaches that I've ever met with are the ones that are ready to go long before the first participant ever shows up. And what that does is that if they're not up there having to staple targets or, you know, set up whatever it happens to be for the day, it allows them time to connect with the participants as they arrive, have these on the side conversations or some very small group, if you will. If you had a group of, let's say, I don't know, 15, 20 participants, but there's two or three standing there, they can start to get around and connect with their, 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 uh, their participants or their, their clients for the day so that they know how to address the day, how to get those students, the most value that they can get in the time that they're there. So again, being managed or being able to manage yourself comes down to how do you manage the session and managing the session has a lot to do with what kind of a connection you may have or may not have with your students. And that starts with having a deeper understanding of what their needs and wants are. The other thing you want to understand is like, what is the use case for the participant and the skill or as it relates to the skill of the tactics that you're coaching for the day. So I see a lot of coaches or a lot of instructors come in and go, this is what we teach. This is how we teach it. Um, and it's this way every time without an understanding of, again, where the participants coming from, what exactly it is that they want out of it. 
every great session that I've ever had with a great coach, um, on the range, off the range, on the mat, whatever it happens to be, has always spent a little time with me to try and understand those things. I think that can be done effectively by coaches in a lot of different ways. Maybe it starts with a pre a pre-class phone call. Again, it's the pre-class conversation. Maybe it's a questionnaire. Um, but at, at any level, these things should be developed in my mind in order to provide a, a, a higher level of instruction and also a great experience for, for the participant. And last, this might sound obvious, but uh, certainly the ability to adapt to the training based on how the participant, it's a one-on-one or participants, are receiving and applying the coaching that's being provided. I think this is very important in a couple different ways. I mean, I've been in situations where, I guess I would look at it this way if I backed up. Whenever I walked into a group class or a group training situation, whether I was, I was training coaches, I was training um, managers, or I was training clients or, or participants in a class, I always kind of looked at the group in, 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 and I divided it up into smaller groups. And the way it always kind of works out is maybe like 20% of the people in there are kind of at the upper level. They're at the, the higher level. They have a higher level of um, uh, competency, uh, understanding, skill sets, and whatever. And then you break that down, then maybe, you know, 30% of the people are pretty good. They've been at it for a while. They're, let's just say they're intermediate and intermediate in whatever the skills and the competencies are, and they're there to get better. They want to be in that top 20%. And as a coach, I want them to be pushed into that top 20%. Then you look at the other 50% and they're kind of a mixed bag, but they're novice to maybe borderline intermediate. And they have, you know, that's the majority of your group, you know, that have similar skill sets. Now that can be a challenge, you know, if you're working in, particularly if you're working into a higher level skill. And certainly if you're teaching, trying to teach tactics, because that bottom 50% probably doesn't have the fundamental skill in order to really perform a lot of it well. That can be problematic in that it can hold the other 50%, the 30 intermediate and the 20 advanced back from gaining the most amount out of the experience that they have in that particular session or class. So a good instructor will be able to recognize this and be able to divide up um, the class and, and instruct to certain parts of the class in a way that where every single group or segment can get the most out of this. Uh, I've seen some 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 uh, some coaches do a really excellent job of this in a couple of different ways, and I've seen others fail miserably. Because the last thing you want is you don't want your your fifty percent to get lost, right? You don't want to give them a terrible experience or or be pushing well beyond their abilities to where they're not getting even the fundamental stuff. And you certainly don't want to lose your top 20% uh, with regard to, dude, this is way too basic. This isn't what you said it was going to be, or this is not what I, I hoped it would be. And obviously that in between 30% is, you know, you don't want them to fall back into the 50 or, or be prevented from uh, being part of the 20. So listen, you, you need to know who's in front of you. And again, a lot of that comes in a screening process. I think you can identify that. And I'll get into a couple other ways where I've seen peop- uh, coaches do a really good job with this. But Knowing how to adapt the class, and whether maybe it's pushing it a little bit further or deeper into, into the subject matter, or maybe it's pulling it back a little bit, a little bit is important. And I think that comes with experience and also knowing your material really well. Here's some, some things, some specific things I took away that really made the difference between, let's just say, great training session and an amazing session that I would recommend uh, to people going down the road. Number one. There was always a preliminary assessment process. I alluded to this a little bit before. Where appropriate, it happened on the phone or in person and up to prior to the session. So again, if you're an instructor and you're not taking time to understand who the people are in your class, it's just, hey, here's who signed up today. And then you're trying to, you're trying to present material. Things are going to get lost. I'm going to get lost. We're not aligned, right? You have think something that you want to deliver. I think I'm getting something. If I don't get that, I'm going to be disappointed, period, end of story. I don't think that's what instructors want. It's certainly not what participants want. So an assessment process of some kind, either prior to the session or at least um, spending some time prior to the, uh, you know, that might be, again, on the phone before the day of or on the day of. You know, maybe in the morning, you make sure you give yourself enough time to get around and chat with people, be social with them, and try to try to obtain some information, some personal information from each person before you get started. Two, there was a thorough verbal coverage of the overview of the class for the day. This included the purpose, 
the importance of what it is that we were going to be learning, the flow, the rationale from where they were coming from. So more of like the what and the why and how to get the most out of the experience, uh, specifically for for each participant. Uh, That was really important for me. Like, this is how you're going to get the most out of this. And then lastly, what to do if you had questions or challenges throughout. Again, going back to how we divide up the class to the different person. Uh, the different types of of students that might be in your class in terms of levels, because I think there's levels in everything. I think this is, this is extraordinarily important. Spend some time up front. Like we all want to get moving. We all came out there to shoot stuff, right? Everybody wants to, to, to to send rounds down range. But if there's, if there isn't a, a really solid setup, I found that a lot of times like, I didn't really understand why I was doing what I was doing. Okay, so you're going to set up with, a, like, a cold standard today. How does this relate to the rest of the things? How do I get the most out of it? How can I be thinking about it in order to get the, or extract the most amount of value from each piece of this class? I had some uh, some excellent experiences with this. I took a low-light rifle and pistol course with Lucas Aguilar of Risen Warrior. We spent uh, probably the first half hour, maybe as, as much as 40 minutes, really talking through how the class was going to be set up for the day and, or for the evening, for the night, and how to how to think about things as we went through the different uh, drills, which he laid out in front of us. There was no surprises uh, that we were going to do the different things and the different things we were going to practice. By the time I left, that was actually my favorite part. I mean, I had fun shooting. I had more fun and I got more value out of putting together the different pieces and understanding how it all flowed and worked. So the thing that did was knowing how organized he was and how he was putting the pieces together, I recognized there was a lot more for me to learn from Lucas outside of what we were learning for that particular session. And again, the way he organized it, the way he explained it, it made sense for me to already be thinking about the next course that I might be taking from Lucas. So something to think about when you get out there, hey, I'm anxious to go sh- to, to shoot as much as anybody else. That's generally why we show up to the range. We pack up all our gear, we get suited up and, and whatever else. But the extra time that you spend, as long as it's well organized and uh, and clearly articulated and done in, a, in, a, in an educational, but also a thorough way, uh, I think... Uh, for me, spells a uh, long-term success, and 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 again, really, really puts to puts in my mind, you know, what's what else is there from this instructor? There's there uh, again, it's very it's it's a it's a good place to start. Next, and this might this might put people off, might feel a little whatever, dude. Um, I've heard it a million times. I don't need to hear it again. But I'm just gonna say it. I really like a practical, a very practical safety brief. And here's, here's my reasons why. This is not like a, again, what I don't like is I don't like I'm doing this bullshit because I'm supposed to super safety brief. I know you guys have heard this a hundred times. We're just going to move through this and be on with it. I, I don't do that um, I because one, what it does is it shows me your level of serious. Uh, safety should be a number one priority when you're out there on the range, whether by yourself or with, with whoever. I want to know that you think that. I understand that we need to get through this. It is kind of a necessary part of what's going on, but I don't think it should be downplayed. The second part is, is I want to know how it specifically applies for today. So as an example, like Jerry from Triple Feed does a really good job with this. Um, the Triple Feed guys are outstanding. I did, I was had the opportunity uh, earlier this year spending three days with them. We did a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, all very different locations um, and all very different applications of, uh, varying applications of different things. One was the first night we were outside with rifles and pistols. The second day we were in a, a shoot house all day with UTMs. And the third day we were out on the range in a different range with shot guns. Here's my point. We spent time at each at each place, each venue going through the safety brief and how it would specifically apply for that particular thing that we were doing. Like, and here's the things that you might look out for. If something's going to go wrong, this is probably where it's going to go wrong. And this is how we'll handle it as a group or as a team. I honestly, I do not appreciate people just going, just running through the safety brief, moving on. That's a personal preference for sure. But the best coaches that have basically handled all the other things that I've already said, also handle their safety brief the same way. It's thorough, it's specific, and it's there's a there's a checks for understanding to make sure everybody's on board. It is not downplayed whatsoever. Here's another big thing. The classes with bigger numbers, that was, uh, you know, like higher numbers. And, th- and again, that's relative to whatever it is you might, you might be teaching. Uh, where there's a greater diversity of knowledge and skills by the per- participants, there were always co-instructors. 
there was at least somebody there to assist where necessary with the coach to make sure that students were getting the most out of what they came there to get. These coaches were were specifically delegated at the beginning and then throughout the, 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 the class or the course where the need was the greatest during the evolution of the session. So, you know, right from the get-go, uh, again, if you've done a good job assessing your people, you might even be able to powwow a little bit of, of that, like, hey, let's keep an eye on these people, or I think these people are going to need a little bit more of this when we get to this section so that they were staying organized. I think it does a couple of things. First off, obviously, it gives the a greater opportunity for success for the students that are in the class because they're going to get the instruction or the help that they need when they need it. But more specifically, it, it allows questions to be asked and feedback to be given outside of when the, the, the instructor or the coach trying to get through the class. So people can be pulled aside or if there is a question that comes up or a concern that comes up that the, the main instructor cannot see or isn't aware of, the co-instructor can, you know, stop for a second, raise their hand, provide some feedback, ask the instructor to cover this thing again. Um, and on that note, uh, those are co-instructors. They're, they're not talking over one another, over the other instructor. I have seen that where there are multiple people on the range at one time or in the class at one time. And it seems like there's all of a sudden now there's this dialogue and everybody's trying to one up one another or talk over one another. It's a clearly defined role. They're there for a specific reason They man and they're managed appropriately. I think this one goes without saying, but I'm going to add something to it. And that is the best instructors always go through a thorough demonstration of all the things that they expect or want the students to do. And they don't just do this. So the, the term demo everything should be a, a mantra from every, every coach. Uh, they, they, you need to be able to demo everything. But more importantly, I think you need to be able to demo it flawlessly. Because if you can't go out, and I use the word flawlessly because this is something that you expect them to be doing for the day. You should be able to show them how to do it perfectly without screwing it up. Now, everybody makes mistakes. Nobody is perfect. But at the same time, it shows me your level of proficiency. It also shows me your level of serious. And so just rushing through that demo and we're just doing this for the sake of doing it so that we can get you guys on to doing this next uh, I think it's bad practice and bad policy. I think that's the that's the time where you need to slow things down. You need to make sure that you show all the things that you expect participants to be able to do. And more specifically, you should be doing that at an expert level. You're up there. You're supposed to be a qualified expert. You better act like it. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, but just as a, as a takeaway, practice what you preach and make sure that when you're out there and you go to that point, Wherever that, whatever that point's going to be, you're prepared and ready. Show that execution of whatever the thing is that you expect your, your, your people to be able to do. Here's another one for you, you uh, instructors that are teaching things that may have more uh, physicality in them or more uh, mental or psychological demand in what you may be providing. And that is, uh, where possible, try to put the heavier material uh, that would be more, again, psychologically or even you know, physically demanding Early in the session, right? Early in the day prior to where that physical fatigue might might set in. I think this is really important as, you know, a lot of times when you're going to these courses, these classes, you could be drinking from a fire hose from an information perspective and from a skills perspective. So here's a good example of that. I took the close contact uh, gunfighter course, which is really a combatives course with uh, Raul from Rogue Methods. And there was a lot of stuff that really needed to be covered preliminarily that that might have seemed a little out of order unless you took the whole class. Unless you were there, you really got it because we were going to get into some combatives and we were going to be rolling around and we were going to be going at it. We were full on. It was full throttle. We were, we were going for it. And so we, what we needed to do is understand the whys and what we were going to be doing early on and be able to process that, that stuff so we weren't trying to figure it out later. I thought this was really important and really valuable. And I've taken other courses where we've done those types of things too, like where we do a lot of the physical or the heavier psychological stuff up front. Uh, we really spend some time in the classroom or we really spend some time walking through things where people are fresh and they get that material. So instructors think about that. Like it may seem linear, but it doesn't always need to be taught like that. If it, there could be a point where you, you, your, your students aren't picking up what you're trying to tell them anyway, because they're just fried. You've just given them too much for the day. So it might not be as linear as you think. You might have to go over here to come back to go over there. Think about that.
Now, in the case of private or very small group instruction, I've done lots of this stuff as well. The coach prior, really prioritized my goals and catered uh, the session to those. Now, that that that's not always possible in the bigger group sessions, right? But certainly in the private sessions, like again, you have this coursework you want to get your 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 client or your participant through. But the best sessions I ever had was somebody that really remembered or took to heart what I had told them of why I was there and the importance of me being there and what I wanted to get out of it. The opposite side of that might sound obvious, but the opposite side of it is I've actually had coaches ask me or coaches ask me that. We've talked about it extensively and then it it never came up. It was never addressed. In fact, some some of the stuff was contrary to what I had said. Clearly you're not listening. Uh, and the, there's, there's not a connection there. That's, that's, that's tough for me, especially if I'm spending my dollars and I'm going to be there, uh, you know, I'm going to be there to train with you. Um, in the larger groups, my goals were still acknowledged. So if I was like in a group of two to six people or whatever else, the competency of the coach was such that they could still address my specific things, maybe even use those as an example to uh, instruct the rest of the group. And while using other people's uh, specific goals as examples as we were going through whatever instruction was for the day. Something that I think is really important that I think gets overlooked a lot is affording your students and your participants the opportunity to ask questions. Um, because, you know, again, for me, there were, there were frequent times where I might've had them. And a lot of times you get like, Hey, has everybody got what I'm saying? You know, is everybody, you know, you know, Roger that like, that's, that's a Roger. That means I either do or I don't. And there really is only one answer for that, right? It's Roger that back. Right. Or is everybody tracking? There's, there's really like, what you're, what you're suggesting by asking the question that way is there shouldn't be any questions. I've just given the instruction. It's time to move on. Um, this is more of a coaching skill, but I think like what questions are there is the question that should be asked because there's always going to be questions. And the best instructors, the best classes I've ever been, been to are the ones where the instructor will slow the things down for a minute and go, hey, let's get through this before we move to the next thing because it's really important as we move on, as explained, at the beginning of this session today, let's make sure we're all on the same page as we, we move forward. So I don't know, asking quick quizzes, putting people on the spot, I think is a good thing. Um, and as they always say, if you've got a question, as chances are somebody else has got a question as a, as a participant, so don't be afraid to ask it. But this also actually, I think, benefits the instructor, not just because you make sure you're, you're, you're bringing your students or your participants along for the day. I think it also helps you to become a better instructor in terms of improving the course of the classwork you're providing. I guess what I mean by that is, hey, I've got this question. That means I didn't do a good job or potentially didn't do a good job of explaining this up front or during the process. How can I adjust appropriately in order to become better at this or master my craft? I want to say that everybody that goes to a class or your, your course as an instructor, they want to be pushed. They want to learn stuff. They want to be challenged. And the best classes I've ever been to are the ones where I felt like I was appropriately pushed. I was challenged even beyond my my limits. Obviously, we have to take into account safety and what's appropriate. But in all of those cases, it was very safe and it was very appropriate. I mean, I was really pushed. I was pushed to, let's just call it like an uncomfortable point. Like, wow, I'm not that great at this or I could really be working on this. Uh, I think it's important that people have successes, but I think it's also people... Uh, p important for people to see where uh, the success is limited and where their failures are. It allows you as a coach to give some very specific feedback on how they can improve that. And also for the the participant to come back and go, hey, you know, like this is where I can be, I can be working on my own in order to move to the next level. So um, I want to be pushed. And I think most people do. So uh, make sure you're doing that with your students at an appropriate level. During that time, I was specifically made aware of whatever my specific shortcomings or areas or room for improvement were. Uh, these were called out to me. These were talked, I was talked to on the side. Again, for some people, maybe it was more fundamental. And for me, it was more of a nuance or a skill that I needed to work on. And But the coaches will, would get around and get their hands on people and go, hey, this is what I'm seeing. This is what I'm noticing. Um, and he even at times kind of pull people aside on the break or whatever to spend some extra time with them, but specifically and appropriately talking to somebody about what their shortcomings are rather than just, hey, you didn't pass this, this cold standard or, you know, you failed at this drill or, you know, you're just expected to know whether you suck or you don't because of the person next to you and what their target looks like as um, with, you know, as it compares to yours. I think there's a, there's a time and a place to be, to be calling people out. 
and they need you need that or they need that you need to do that to show you know some integrity um, but doing it in an appropriate way and making sure you're giving specific feedback rather than you know group feedback like everybody should be doing this I think taking the time if you're out there for three fucking hours and you got 15 people in your class that's more than enough time to give at least each person some type of specific feedback last things I'll finish up with first off in my greatest experiences I was always inspired I was inspired by the, by the instructors, I was inspired by the, the, the participants, uh, to be better, to get better, to, to, to do more, uh, and to want to come back. This is different than motivation. Uh, motivation is in, is internal, um, and it's fleeting, uh, inspiration, I think comes, uh, from the external and it comes from the people. It comes from all the things that we've already talked about. Uh, but I was inspired, be inspiring as an instructor. Don't be a dick. Don't try to be a hero. Uh, don't try and stand up there on the stage and, and be the man for the day or, or whatever the case is like be inspiring. And I think there's multiple ways to do that. I was thanked. I was thanked for coming out. I was thanked for being part of the training. I was thanked for trusting them. I was thanked for making the commitment and making the financial commitment to being there to, to train with them. Don't forget that these people are out there on their own time, on their own dime and, uh, out of their own free will. And I think it's important that you thank people. I, I can't tell you how many times I've been out there and people are like, Hey, you know, cool. It's good to see you. And, or that's the end of the day. Uh, see you next time. Uh, kind of thing. Um, I don't know that that's odd to me. Uh, but I really, I really respect, I take pride in making sure I thank people for, for what they provide for me. And I expect the same in return. Might seem simple. I think a thank you. Simple. Thank you goes a long way. I had fun. Like shit's got to be fun. If it's not fun, I don't want to come, right? Like I understand that there's work to be put in and I might be frustrated during the day, but at the end of the day, I want to have fun. All of these sessions I went to that where I had these great coaches, they made it fun for the group. They were having fun. They didn't, like you could see it on them. Like they were passionate about being out there. Uh, they were having a good time. If you're having fun, generally speaking, I think your clients are going to have fun. I want to have fun. Um, and, you know, in, in all these experiences, I've been to a lot of classes where they weren't very fun, where I walked away going that, that sucked, you know, like I got some trigger time, but it wasn't awesome. I want it to be awesome. And awesome. I think a lot of times starts with having fun. Lastly, I'll say, I'll say this in, in closing, as we wrap up, I built relationships in these, in these great classes from these great coaches. And I value those relationships to this day. These are people that I can reach out to. Um, they've made themselves available to me. And I don't just mean the instructors. I mean the people that were in those classes. What I found is cool people generally hang out with other cool people. Um, inspiring people generally hang out with other inspiring people. And that's who I want to be around as a participant uh, in these things. And that's who I want to be as a coach. Uh, and I want to have relationships with those people. So th I think that's probably one of the greater takeaways that I've gotten from these amazing sessions is the, the relationship building that goes on and really building the community is what, uh, you know, what this, this, um, should be about a few words just here in regards to some of the shit instruction and experiences that I, I have come across. First off, being a coach is a responsibility, right? It, just like it's my responsibility to train, um, it's your responsibility to be a coach. So once you enter into the world of coaching or instruction, know that you're now held to a higher standard. Um, I'm going to hold, hold you to a higher standard. Other people should be doing that too. And I think our industry does a pretty good job of policing that. If it's not helpful to say or do, just leave it off the table. Just don't even bring it to the table. If it doesn't need to be said, don't say it. Be a professional. You, you, be responsible. You could add to that. It's a privilege. So count your blessings as an instructor um, to, that you're out there and that people are trusting in you to, uh, to, to help them. As my good friend, uh, Chris Curtis down at Condition One would say, it's a free market. So do what you want, but you're also not God's gift as an instructor. Nobody is. You're not inventing anything. You're not, you're not, you haven't started anything. You know, you're, 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 you're really taking all the things that you've learned along, along the way and putting them out there in a different kind of way. Maybe you didn't invent any of this stuff. Um, and so don't act like you did. Everybody starts somewhere. And a lot of that time that starts with regurgitation of information. If you're going to do that, I don't know, maybe give credit to where you're getting it from and uh, let and let people know all the information you're giving you got from somebody else. So don't forget where you came from and certainly don't forget that. At the end of the day, this is a community and it and it needs outstanding people uh, in it that care about doing the right thing. So don't be a dick. I mean, it's just, 
I, I'm 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 doing this this podcast in this way today because I've I've come across some dicks. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. If you are a dick, then don't get butt hurt for being called out for being a dick, uh, because it'll make you look more sad than you already are if you just be an asshole. Ultimately, this is going to be short lived for you because people are going to figure it out. I already said this, cool people hang around with cool people, good people hang around with other good good people, and you're going to wind up alienating yourself. So just, you know, there's no room for that. If you're a person that likes to be treated like an asshole, um, then there's plenty of those people out there right now. But um, I don't don't think it's going to be long-lived, and I don't think you're going to get very far far with it. The very last thing I'll say is I think it's important for us all to share our experiences in a productive and a positive way, wherever we can and, and whenever possible. That said... The barrier of entry to be a firearms instructor is very low. I try to remember that and be patient um, and understanding when I see some instructor out running his or her headlights from from time to time. It's it's going to happen. Um, this is always part of the process in any kind of a, a coaching process. People are always going to try to do a little bit more than they probably should be doing. I think that's healthy to a certain extent as long as you're learning uh, along the way. Any experienced or veteran coach worth his or her salt uh, will agree with that statement. So try to be constructive as a fellow coach or a participant uh, when and where possible. The best way to do that is be remarkable as an individual and inspire others to do the same.